In the 8 and 16-bit eras of gaming, one company became synonymous with the video games, Nintendo. With their large number of high-quality and innovative games, the NES and Super Nintendo managed to stay on top as the best-selling home consoles worldwide in each of their respective generations, despite some heavy competition. So it's no surprise that gamers were waiting in anticipation for their next big console, and their first made for the newfound 3D era of gaming. While Nintendo's biggest competitors, Sega and PlayStation, built consoles around 32-bit architecture and CD technology, Nintendo proudly jumped ahead to 64 bits, and stuck with using cartridge-based games as they had with all of their past successes. Of course, this jump in technology also meant there was a bit of a longer wait. While the Sega Saturn and Sony PlayStation would launch in Japan in late 1994 and late 95 in many other regions, the Nintendo 64, as it would be known, would need nearly two extra years, launching in Japan in June of 96 and in North America on September 26 of the same year. Due to various factors, such as the increased price of sticking with cartridges compared to CDs, there ended up being a much smaller launch lineup than you would normally expect from an established console maker. In fact, you're looking at the entire launch lineup right now. This was actually somewhat of a sign of things to come, as the rest of the year saw the release of only six additional games, bringing the system's entire library up to only eight titles by the end of the year. So how did these games turn out? Was this a case of quality over quantity? Was it worth being an early N64 adopter? Let's find out by chronologically looking at all eight of the system's North American releases from 1996, from its launch in September to the end of the year. First up is Pilot Wings 64. This is a follow up to Pilot Wings, which was itself a launch game for the Super Nintendo, making it only the second game in the series and not the 64th. Mm, sorry, I won't make that joke again. The game has you taking on various challenges while piloting one of three airborne vehicles, these vehicles being a hang glider, a jetpack that they refer to as a rocket belt for some reason, and a gyrocopter. A given challenge could be something like flying through rings, shooting targets with missiles, or taking photos of predetermined spots in the environment. Actually, speaking of the photos, each save profile can store up to six of these to view later. There are various aspects in each challenge that play into your overall score, including time, accuracy, and damage taken. And depending on the score, you can receive a bronze, silver, or gold medal. The tests you start with are pretty easy, and I even managed to get 100 on my first try in the level 1 hang glider mission. But after that, things definitely take a lot more practice to master. Unlike the first game, where you played as a nameless pilot, this one has a cast of 6 cartoony characters you can choose from at the beginning of each stage. I kinda like how you don't need to pick one character to play the whole game with. Just choose who you feel like playing as at the moment. Random story. One of my friends had this game and always referred to Hawk, the mustache guy, as being fat. Is he fat? Just looks muscular to me. This game can have a very relaxing feel when you're not attempting a difficult task or too worried about receiving the best score. I could see someone just chilling out while playing this and maybe putting on their own tunes in the background. Though that's not to say the music that plays in the game itself is bad. To add to this chill vibe, you can unlock the Birdman suit, which lets you just fly around the various stages and take in the scenery without worrying about an objective or time limit. While Pilot Wings 64 isn't the groundbreaking experience that the next game we'll be looking at is, it's definitely a likable game, and just worth giving a try. Mario! Yep, Super Mario 64 is the second and final game of the N64's North American launch. This is, of course, the more noteworthy of the two launch games. In fact, it's the most noteworthy and iconic game we'll be looking at in this video, period. 
as I am sure you know, this is a 3D platformer. Maybe THE 3D platformer, as it really did a lot to define what the genre became. You have an overworld that is Princess Peach's castle, with levels that you usually enter through various paintings that are scattered throughout said castle. Again, something you're probably already aware of. The levels themselves have a lot of variety. There are snow levels, underwater levels, underground levels, etc. In these levels, you have various goals that award you with stars upon completion. Obtain enough of these stars to gain access to new areas of the castle. Again, I am sure you already know all of this, but it is cool playing the game while remembering that this overall template basically originated here. Most of the controls and movement still feel great. Compared to what was seen in his prior games, or 3D games in general at the time, Mario can do a lot, and still feels very fluid to control. A benefit of the system's inclusion of an analog stick. That said, the game's camera system hasn't aged quite as well. It's easy to get stuck in a spot where you have no choice but to accept a less than ideal camera angle. It's acceptable, but it is something that's worth noting. Still, it is vastly better than a majority of early 3D games that gave you control of the camera. That's a thing you need to remember when looking at this game. It innovated and improved in so many areas, and did a lot to push 3D gaming, and gaming in general, forward. From its controls, to the level and sound design, to the overall presentation and level of freedom, it really was a huge leap forward for gaming. My past videos in this series have covered PlayStation and Sega consoles, and while both companies have had their share of noteworthy and industry-changing games, they were never the ones to launch with their systems. Nintendo has always been much better in that area, and this is one of their best examples of that. Now, it would be easy to go on and on about Super Mario 64's influence on gaming, but that's probably better left to a video that's focused specifically on that topic. In terms of these N64 launch year games, this is undoubtedly the best, and is arguably the best game on the system. I mean, it's the reason a lot of people bought a Nintendo 64 to begin with. Wave Race 64 This game came out a little over a month after the N64's release, on November 4th, 1996. This is also the last game we'll be looking at with the number 64 in its title. As you'd expect from that title, Wave Race 64 is a racing game. A jet ski racing game to be precise. You pick from one of four racers and zoom around various aquatic courses, which feature some very impressive water effects for their time. It actually kind of reminds me of the PS1 racing game Jet Moto, which had similar style courses, although that game is not nearly as impressive visually. It is also a 96 release. This game is a sequel to the 1992 Game Boy game Wave Race. Unlike that game though, Wave Race 64 heavily uses the Kawasaki license for its vehicles and signage, and the company's name even adorns the box art in many regions. One thing that makes this game feel a bit different from other games of its genre is that there is a big emphasis on driving around cones. As you go through a race, you see cones with an arrow pointing left or right. Properly following these directions gives you a speed boost. Miss one, and you lose it. Actually, if you miss five of these, you fail the race. It is fairly satisfying driving around them, though it is a bit odd that you absolutely have to do it. Another thing that makes this game feel different from most racers is how the vehicles handle. You can completely spin your jet ski around in an instant. This is realistic, so it's not necessarily an issue. It's just a different feel that may take you a few minutes to adjust to if you're used to the less sensitive controls of other racing games. Still, it's very fun. I had a great time driving through the game's initial six courses. One more thing, you can actually rename the drivers if you want. A nice addition, I guess. This was yet another great example of the N64's capabilities. Again, the water effects looked nothing like what was being seen on other systems at the time. Though, the PS1 actually did get a very good imitation of this look in the 1998 game Crash Bandicoot Warped. 
Still, this was a whole two years before that. This is another one that would have been worth picking up, which makes it three good games in a row. Very diverse too. Not bad so far. On November 15th of 96, N64 owners got Mortal Kombat Trilogy. Based on the name, you may think this is a collection of the first three Mortal Kombat games, but it's not quite that. Mortal Kombat Trilogy is the final revision of Mortal Kombat 3, featuring 3's gameplay, but with the addition of characters and stages from the previous two entries. It's kind of like the final culmination of the first three games. It also should be noted that this is not a Nintendo release, making it the first third-party game we'll be looking at. In terms of the gameplay, it's Mortal Kombat. Pick from a cast of deadly warriors and fight to the death. Typical MK stuff. Still, there are a lot of aspects to MK Trilogy that make it stand out among the N64's launchier games. Compared to the previous three games we looked at, which were great showcases of the system's capabilities, this game is very unimpressive. In fact, it's completely 2D, which can't be said for any of the other games we'll be looking at. It's also the only game that appeared on other consoles, as there was a PlayStation version that came out at around the same time, and a Saturn version that came out early in the following year. These versions are pretty identical, though they do have a short little FMV of the Mortal Kombat logo which you don't see on the N64. They also have higher quality music and sound effects due to being on the CD format. Considering the N64 was boasting to be twice as powerful as its competitors, it sure wasn't obvious if you looked at this game. Also, you can use the D-pad to control your fighters in this game, which was actually fairly uncommon among most N64 games, as they tended to barely use the thing or not use it at all. So that's a plus, but the rest of the default controls are kinda weird. A and B punch, the left C button blocks, the down C button runs, and the right and up C button kicks. L and R are used for blocking and running as well. Luckily, you can customize this, but I thought it was a bit of an odd placement. Well, the N64's controller is an odd one, so I guess it makes sense that they couldn't figure out what to do with it. Unfortunately, this game would have been a solid argument to get a PlayStation or Saturn instead of a Nintendo 64. Those versions controlled and sounded better, and on top of that, cost about $20 less. The N64 didn't have the load times that those versions did, but that's about it. Fatality. Next is Wayne Gretzky's 3D Hockey. This game shares the same November 15th release date with Mortal Kombat Trilogy, making it tied with that game as the first third-party N64 release in North America. As with MK Trilogy, this game was published by Midway. This is a port of the arcade game of the same name, which came out only a month prior, and it definitely has that arcadey feel. There are a reduced number of players compared to more realistic hockey games, similar to NBA Jam's take on basketball. The puck also constantly strobes at all times to let you know where it is. I kinda like that, as it makes it basically impossible to lose track of. There's also the fact that you can get into fights. Now, this isn't uncommon among realistic hockey games, but this one feels much more like a fighting game than usual. In fact, similar to the other Midway game that we just talked about, this game was initially intended to include a mild form of fatalities at the end of these fights. but that was unfortunately dropped at the last minute, for obvious reasons, and isn't included in any official version of the game. It's worth mentioning that this is the only concurrent 4-player game to release for the N64 in 96. Kinda interesting Nintendo themselves weren't the first ones to make use of all those controller ports. This is actually not the first Wayne Gretzky game that I've covered in a launch games video, as the PSP launched with Gretzky NHL. 
if I had to pick one of the two to recommend, I'd definitely go with 3D Hockey. I had a decent time with both, but the less serious tone of this one would probably make it easier for the average gamer to get into. If you're an early N64 adopter who is into sports, or just wanted something to play with a large group of friends, this would have been worth getting. A textbook play! 20 seconds left! Is it scores! And now, Killer Instinct Gold. This game came out 10 days after the previous two, on November 25th of 96. This is yet another fighting game, with the same edgy 90s vibe as MK Trilogy. However, they aren't completely alike. While both games have 2D pre-rendered fighters, this one features 3D stages to fight in. They are somewhat dynamic as well, with little touches such as trash cans being knocked over if you run into them. The gameplay is pretty fun. Landing blows on your opponents has a very satisfying feel, especially if you turn on the blood. Though, why is this off by default? Oh, Nintendo. Speaking of which, this is another first-party Nintendo game, and was developed by their go-to western team of the 90s, Rare. It is also the second game in its series, being based on the arcade version of Killer Instinct 2. This game's default controls are more ideal than what Mortal Kombat went with. B in the top two C-buttons punch, and A in the bottom two C-buttons kick. Now, these are the controls I was assuming MK Trilogy to have before playing that one. It's a lot more natural than having the block and run buttons being sandwiched in the middle. And luckily, this is another game that lets you use the D-pad. While the characters in this game aren't as iconic as Mortal Kombat, they are likable. Aside from the typical badass human fighters, there are also a number of monster fighters, such as a skeleton and a werewolf. When I was a kid, I was pretty obsessed with monsters. Had you asked me to pick between the two games in 1996, I 100% would have gone with this one. This game has a really awesome techno soundtrack as well. It's definitely the most 90s sounding game we've come across so far. However, it could have really benefited from being on the CD format, as it sounds fairly compressed compared to most music you would have heard on the PS1 or Saturn. Though, if the sound really bothered you, there was an officially released soundtrack that you could have purchased, which featured the tracks in a much higher quality. Even without that though, it's still one of the better sounding soundtracks of this lineup, being far less cheesy and last gen sounding than some. If I had to pick one area where I preferred MK Trilogy, it's the movement speed of your fighters. In this one, they just walk so incredibly slow. I really don't like that. But it doesn't ruin the game. In most ways, this is the more well-presented and better playing experience. While I don't think it's nearly as good as the options that were available on the PlayStation or Saturn at the time, this would have been the better fighter to get for the N64 in 96. Cruisin' USA. This game came out on December 3rd of 96, making it our first December game. This is yet another arcade port, again coming from Midway. Though, this one was a bit more of a joint venture than their previous games, actually being published by Nintendo. You know, Midway was kind of like Nintendo's equivalent to Namco during PlayStation's launch. Namco put out quite a few arcade ports early in the PlayStation's life and Midway did the same for the N64. Anyway, on to the actual game. This is a racer that has you traveling across the USA, from California to Washington DC. These are single lap races, which is a nice change of pace if you're used to the multi-lap races that you usually see in racing games. As with Wave Race, this game is very sensitive in its handling, which I don't think works quite as well here. Luckily, you can change that. It's another game that has questionable default controls. You're supposed to hold the Z button to accelerate, but I found this to quickly feel uncomfortable, and even a little painful. You actually can use the D-pad to control your car in this one, so maybe they wanted you to hold it like this? Uh, again though, this can be changed. 
holding A to accelerate and B to brake while using the D-pad to steer was what worked best for me. The racing itself is actually very easy compared to the arcade racers on other systems at the time. Despite the fact that you crash by simply touching the side of another vehicle or obstacle, you recover nearly instantaneously. It took me only one or two tries to get through every race I played. One thing I can appreciate about this game is the fact that it has an Iowa stage, because I myself am from Iowa. It's not often you see games that go there, though I kinda hate the hillbilly music they chose for it. That's not a problem though, because the game has a button that lets you change the music whenever you want. 90s house music, that's more like it. Okay, that constant hooting is kind of funny. Really, this game's music as a whole is kind of weird, like the main menu theme. Actually, listen to this song. Doesn't this sound like Pumped Up Kicks by Foster the People? Another thing that's kind of funny is how you instantly slam to a halt at the end of these races. I mean, it's either that or crash into this crowd of people. There was a pizza place my family often went to when I was growing up that had the arcade version of this game, and they kept it around for years, so this may be the game from this lineup that I've played the most other than Mario 64. Sadly, that pizza place eventually replaced the cabinet with a golf game. A golf game. Those bastards. Anyway, if you played that version, it's generally more well received than the N64 version, though that's not uncommon with arcade ports. Really, this game is just okay. It's another case where the PS1 and Saturn had better options in terms of Ridge Racer and Daytona USA, respectively. But if you had an N64 and wanted an arcade racer, I guess this would have been acceptable. Now we get to the final Nintendo 64 game of 1996 with Star Wars Shadows of the Empire. Well, technically this and Cruising USA are tied for that spot, as they both came out on the same day. As with Cruising USA, this is a third party developed game that was published by Nintendo, but unlike the others we've looked at, this game had nothing to do with Midway, instead being developed by LucasArts. This makes it the only non-Midway third party N64 release of 96. This game has you taking on the role of Smuggler Dash Rendar in events that take place during and between The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, and is part of a larger multimedia project that shared the same Shadows of the Empire name. The story is told via fairly nice looking, though unvoiced, cutscenes featuring a mix of 2D and 3D graphics. The gameplay has a lot of variety. While it does feature your typical run and gun explorational stages, there are also levels that are focused entirely around piloting vehicles, such as the first stage, which is based around the Hoth segment from Empire, or another stage that has you blasting at ships in space using a stationary turret. Even the more typical stages do a bit to mix things up, like having a level that takes place entirely on moving trains, or having you make use of a jetpack. Really, there are quite a few neat set pieces for its time. The game also gives you plenty of camera options, which is nice. In my case, switching to first person view made the vehicle segments much easier. Still, the game isn't without issues. For starters, there are limited lives, which feels a bit strange for a game of this type. You can lose quite a lot of progress and have to restart a fairly big level if you run out of them. Of course, that was the norm at the time. Another thing, the shooting kinda sucks. You'll automatically aim at enemies who are directly in front of you, which is fine for stormtroopers, 
but very difficult for small flying robots. The worst thing though is the movement. When you stop moving, you take a few steps before slowing down to a halt. This makes it easy to accidentally fall off ledges, and there are a lot of ledges in this game. In contrast, there is the much more natural feeling Mario 64, but also the original Tomb Raider, which came out only a few months prior. People love to give that game crap for its quote unquote tank controls, but it does a much better job of giving you a sense of control over your jumping and movement. Another title that is worth comparing this to is the 1995 game Star Wars Dark Forces, which had a PS1 port that was released only a few weeks before this game. In some ways, that game is superior. If you're a fan of Doom style FPS games, that is certainly the better game for you. And even without that preference, I do think the shooting has a much more satisfying feel. It also has very similar looking cutscenes, but they are actually voiced though they're also much lower res due to being pre-rendered. But look at it, the visuals are much worse. And it doesn't have the same variety. Lastly, this is a rare case where the N64 soundtrack is vastly better, featuring actual orchestrated tracks, some from the movies, and some that were newly produced for the Shadows of the Empire multimedia project. As you'd expect, it is a bit compressed, but it's by no means terrible sounding. It's kind of a feat they managed to make it work within the N64's storage constraints. In contrast, Dark Forces features really bland MIDI renditions of the Star Wars music. Despite the aspects that haven't aged well, this isn't a bad game. And while I don't quite agree, some publications even listed it as the second best N64 game after Mario 64 at the time of its release. One thing I can say with certainty, if you were looking for the Star Wars experience in video game form in 1996, this would have absolutely been the game to get. Well, there you have it, the Nintendo 64's North American launch games and everything else that came out for the system in 96. An extremely small lineup, all things considered, but a solid one. Still, if you compare it to the amount of quality games that are available from its competition at the same time and into the future, it is understandable why it never quite managed to catch up in sales, even if it did get its fair share of must-have titles. Regardless, it is a very unique console that is well worth looking back on. I should probably mention now that some of these games are a bit spotty on their exact release dates with conflicting reports from various sources, something I've found to be common when looking up information from this era. For example, some places say MK Trilogy came out on Halloween of 96. However, others disagree and I even found a Toys R Us ad that lists the November 15th release date that I ultimately went with for this video. Regardless of if some of the dates turn out to be a bit off, every source seems to at least agree that these are the games that came out for the system in 1996. This was my seventh launch games video, and my first to cover an entire launch year. If you like this, be sure to subscribe to see more like it in the future. It would be much appreciated. Fans of the channel may also want to consider supporting it on Patreon for early access footage, a chance to pick games for review, and more. With that said, I think it's about time to finally wrap things up. As always, thanks for watching The Legend of Games.